please welcome Courtney. Hello. I was totally expecting this room to empty out um, and not have everybody here after the last talk. She was so fantastic. So thank you so much for joining me today to talk about how you can unlock collaboration through leveraging policies and guardrails in your Kubernetes deployments. Um, I was supposed to be with a co-host today, so before we dive in, my name is Courtney Nickerson. I'm obviously the Calvin of this um, presentation. My Hobbs, I swear, he's not a figment of my imagination. Ole Lenzmar, our CTO, does exist. Uh, unfortunately, his flight got delayed and then canceled and then delayed again, and so he's not going to make it in until this afternoon. Um, which means that there have been quite a few changes and adjustments at the very last minute to this. So if at some point in time I am staring at my screen or I, my mind goes blank, that was not my slide to present. So bear with me, but I really do appreciate your patience. Um, so today we're going to be covering quite a few things. Uh, but some background on why we're having this uh, with soaring adoption of Kubernetes Obviously, a, there's loads of different situations that are happening now for DevOps teams. Um, DevOps landscape is drastically changing was, and, and really struggling sometimes in order to scale as we move into scaling our deployments to pods and clusters. There's loads of different challenges that have now presented themselves um, that teams kind of have to be able to uh, attack as, as they're moving into this new cloud native era. Um, and that's kind of pushed DevOps into a new adolescence. It's a little bit difficult to handle for some teams as they start to adopt Kubernetes. For other teams, they've been able to make the step into Kubernetes, but then there's constantly a gap that's growing between their development team, their operations team, and sometimes it's really hard to uh, get those teams to collaborate and, and bridge those gaps. Um, so all of this has also given a, um, opportunities for new roles to arise. We now have SREs, platform engineers. We have new types of technology as well. So platform as a service is something that we're going to be hearing loads about this next week. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that there's still a persistent issue with trying to actually bridge the communication gap and, and the working gap between development teams and operations. So today we're going to take a little bit of a look at different things that we can do to leverage policies and guardrails to actually become the common language among teams as they're trying to learn how to collaborate in a much more scaled environment. Um, we will identify and discuss some of the main challenges that teams are facing as they scale their DevOps culture. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Not sure what I didn't mean to do that. Um, we will share how to implement different policies and guardrails. Uh, we'll have a brief overview of what policies are and policy frameworks and the tooling in this ecosystem, because it turns out some people are using policies a lot. Other teams aren't using them quite so much. So we'll have a brief overview of that, and then we will look at how teamwork can actually make, make the dream work and make your deployments better. Um, so let's take a look at the actual challenges and gaps that occur when people are trying to adopt Kubernetes and scale their DevOps. Uh, workflows and culture. Um, so kind of since the inception of DevOps, it's kind of been a contentious definition of what it actually is, very multifaceted. Uh, is it a culture? Is it somebody's actual role? Is it an engineer? Is it a defined set of workflows? It could be any of those things. Um, but whatever your answer is, what's remarkable about DevOps is that it continues to remain very timely and in high demand. And a lot of that has to do with just the amount of a potential a business value that it actually provides for teams when executed well. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that scaling something that is still difficult to define, whether it's a culture or a workflow or both of those things, becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, for one, DevOps 
teams rely very heavily on the tooling that they're using. And so finding ways to integrate and automate the usage of, of the right tools for your team becomes very difficult as you're trying to make this leap. Um, obviously, standardizing those tools uh, is, is difficult, but even more important and almost just as critical is a standardizing the processes and the practices that your team is actually using across different teams and cross-functional teams. Um, in order to be able, be able to leverage the advantages that those toolings actually provide. Um, and I'm, <laughs> that doesn't even start to talk about a, how difficult it is to uphold consistency as you're actually going through all of this across the board. Um, and managing security and compliance could be a whole talk on its own. A, this has always been something that's kind of been left to the end. Nobody's super passionate about it except for the few of us that are. Everybody thinks it's a very boring topic. Um, today, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you won't find it quite as boring. Uh, it is pretty useful, but the reality is, is that it could be a talk all on its own. It's a very complex thing in order to do, and so when we scale to Kubernetes, those challenges scale also. Um, but those are just tools and workflows and processes that we're talking about scaling. The thing that's actually really difficult to scale is the DevOps culture. So finding ways for people to be able to communicate with each other, to collaborate with each other, to make those workflows more efficient and effective, to adapt the practices that they're doing to an entirely new environment that they actually need to learn quite a few things. There's a huge learning curve for so many people. Um, and in order to be able to bridge that gap, things can get very difficult. And on top of it, uh, you're never going to find two DevOps workflows that are the same or two DevOps cultures that are the same. A, between the industry changing, the resource constraints, and that could be constraints on budget or human restraints, right? Your human resources, knowledge gaps, not having enough talent a, on your team and just not being able to find enough people to, to deal with what you need to deal with. Um, your tech stack, all of those things make every single DevOps pipeline very unique and also very difficult with its own challenges to actually scale it. Um, unfortunately, as well, siloed teams and siloed workflows are still very much a thing. They're very prominent, and it happens to everyone. Even the best of Dev DevOps cultures have moments in time where they have siloed workflows going on. Um, and so when we scale to Kubernetes, that gap that exists in communication between teams actually continues to broaden. So we have to find a way to be able to bridge the gap that's already there in existence from before we scale and so that it doesn't continue to get bigger and bigger. And so that's kind of where policies and guardrails come into the mix. Um, we just described a bunch of challenges that people have, a, but the one thing that all of those challenges have in common is that in order to be able to a, have success and a success rate in terms of adopting Kubernetes and scaling it, you have to find ways for your human team members to collaborate and connect with each other. There's no other way to do it, and that really is the commonality between all of the different complexities that you have in, in scaling your DevOps pipeline. So introducing robust policies and guardrails into your pipeline plays a critical role in fostering a culture of collaboration and unity across your teams because policies very much become a contract between your teams. They establish clear guidelines, they standardize your practices, they provide a common ground for people to actually find a way to transcend what are usually their boundaries and their siloed workflows and decide that they're going to be able to collaborate because they're all working for the same objective. They all now have rules that have been set that they need to follow. So when you're leveraging policies with a purpose, they actually help to foster and culture a collaborative and responsible um, environment among your team. Also, it's a way to empower absolutely everyone. And while that might sound silly at times, the truth is a lot of times when you have complications that are going on in your team, it's because people don't feel empowered and they don't feel like they're being listened to or they don't feel like anybody really understands the value of the work that they're doing. So in using um, policies and involving everyone across your team in terms of helping to define the different things that need to be done in each workflow, you're actually finding ways to empower 
your devs team, your operations team, your SREs, your platform engineers. And that actually cultivates a whole sense of empathy because people start to understand what other people's challenges are in other departments. They're much more willing to abide by the rules that have been placed there, as well as speak up about their own needs. Um, so that's kind of the reason that you might want to a, go ahead and, and involve policies and guardrails in your DevOps pipeline. Um, let me see. Oh, it just froze. There we go. So planning to build the bridge to bridge that gap uh, is a bit more complicated. Um, we're going to start off with just a very brief overview. How many of you are using policies and guardrails at this point in time? Oh, so you do all think it's super boring and useless. <laughs> Fantastic. Right? It, we'll talk about it. We're, get, we're getting there, building up the suspense. Um, so policy is very much in Kubernetes, YAML serves as a framework to define your desired state uh, of your clusters, your applications, your networks. And Kubernetes policies are very much guiding rules in order to make sure that the creation of all of those things is done correctly and securely and it, you have all of your compliance, which compliance is boring. You didn't hear it from me, but compliance is boring. Um, but all these po uh, policies can be a can be classified in different ways. We have configuration policies. They very much deal with just about anything that you possibly have to configure, from security, resource allocations, best practices, naming conventions, labeling conventions, all of those things. If you need to configure it, you can create a policy for it. And then the other side of policies are runtime policies, and those very much are policies that govern security and access control, um, actually, operative in your cluster. That's a very brief overview um, of how policies are, of what policies actually are. And integrating them obviously helps you be a compliant, but a whole lot more efficient uh, across the board. Um, so how are policies defined? Well, there's a few ways of defining policies. Very quickly, a policies can be defined by declarative and imperative uh, approaches. Um, YAML is oftentimes the, the main language, but it doesn't always have to be. Declarative policies, uh, specifically tools like Kaivorno, use declarative uh, policies in YAML uh, configurations and based rules in order to enforce your policies in, in your cluster. Um, there are also imperative policies, and those are black. Uh, those uh, need other types of languages in order to write them. So anything from YAML to Cell, which is a common, um, a, 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 oh my gosh, common expression language. Excuse me. Um, and Cell policies have just not been included in the latest version of Kubernetes. So if you haven't started with policies, that's a very good place to start. Um, but uh, they're very easy to, to write and get started with. You can use loads of other languages as well to TypeScript, to Go, kind of adapt to what you need. But additionally, um, by specification, so Kubernetes pod security standards, they're also a fantastic place to start. They're very simple and straightforward. You categorize the things that you need by privileged, baseline, and restricted. And then basically, a, when you run that, it allows your application any combination of those standards a, to actually have specific security that's, that's needed. Um, applying policies to your YAML, when should you do this? Well, there are loads of different policy enforcement points a, across the policy enforcement pipeline. You can do this in your pre-commit phase, in a pre-merge phase. You can do it when you deploy, which very much, if any of you are Kyverno or OPA gatekeeper users, um, that's probably when you're doing it. That's the most common practice. It's fantastic. It serves as a fantastic safety net to make sure to see what has slipped through into your cluster. You can also do it in, in runtime. Um, but whenever you do it, you should be doing this. So applying them earlier is better. We hear this every time we hear anything about DevSecOps or security in general. Obviously, if you are just starting to adopt Kubernetes, if you build policies and guardrails into the adoption plan, it's a much easier lift once you get started because they're already there. 
However, you can't always build everything in super early and you can't always apply policies through pre-commit and pre-merge phases. Sometimes you're going to have things that you're going to have to look at in runtime. And so applying policies um, as early as possible obviously saves you a lot of time in some, in some instances, but it's not always going to be possible, which is why a, you should always be using your safety net of running um, an admission policy, a, an admission control policy uh, for your misconfigurations that might have passed through. Um, on a personal note, shift left. This is very much something that irks me a little bit. So everybody in security is always talking about shifting left and that creates a terrible developer experience just by saying it because developers already have loads of things to do and so as soon as you say, oh, we need to shift this left, they're automatically thinking, I already have so much going on. What do you mean shifting left? And specifically using policies and guardrails as a way to shift left but also shift right. It's a way of including everybody, but also sharing the responsibility of security across teams. And that is incredibly important and crucial to do if you want to actually be able to not only scale your DevOps workflows and culture, but also get to a point where you have high quality deployments across the board. So it's one of those things, communication and culture are key. If you're saying to your dev team, we're going to shift everything left, they're going to stop listening to you. But if you say, we're going to have policies and guardrails in the pre-commit phase, and some of those are going to be for developers, our ops team is also going to be doing these things, our SRE team is also going to be employing these rules, all of a sudden the responsibility is shared across the board, it's a much better experience for everyone, and everyone feels seen and included. So also, it's not all about policies, guardrails as well, it's included in the title, so we'll have a quick moment. Um, guardrails are also super important. They're a diverse set of approaches that teams can use to employ and ensure a, the development and the deployment of their, of their applications is actually compliant. And they're very easy to put in when you're talking about scaling things. Um, these approaches include implementation from anything like configuration policies, which we were talking about earlier, to leveraging YAML configuration templating, also using tools like Helm and Customize uh, in order to make sure you have an effective management of your, of your configurations. Loads of you, is anybody, are people here using Helm and Customize to package your, great. So uh, those are also ways, uh, especially using dry runs, to be able to see the configurations or misconfigurations of, of your policies. Um, but successful implementation, implementation of these guardrails ensures that there's a cohesive and collaborative approach um, to building and deploying your applications. So building the bridge. Teamwork makes the dream work. It's always the case, isn't it? Um, in order to get something done, you need all of your team to, to be on board. It really is an all-hands-on-deck type of thing. However, there are some uh, hands-on things that you can do to get started. So talking about where to get started. Uh, Validation, ad, admission validation policies, which are now active in version 128 of Kubernetes, great place to get started. Pod security standards, great place to get started. But even better than that is to take a step back and talk to your team and get everyone involved. Um, that ensures that there's a shared understanding of the actual needs that not just one team has or just the entire workflow has, but that everybody has. A lot of times around policies, it seems really boring, we're back to the boring part. But also, a lot of times it's because teams don't really understand how they're going to be leveraged. Having a set of rules actually makes a developer experience much better because then they know exactly what to focus on. They know where they should be putting their efforts. They know that they're not going to misconfigure something that then when put into production is going to cause issues and problems for other people because some amount of rule has been established that lets them do their work a lot easier, a lot more efficiently and with a lot more calm. So getting everyone involved, super important so that they all understand the needs, the requirements um, and the constraints that each different team has. The next thing to do is don't wait, right? So back to the whole, if, if you're adopting Kubernetes, this is something that if you build your policies and guardrails in, you're actually going to be building that bridge to gap, the, uh, to bridge the gap of communication among your teams as you're adopting your policies so that the gap of communication doesn't continue to grow 
and your bridge doesn't have to be anywhere near as large because you started to build it sooner. But obviously, there are so many of us here that have already adopted Kubernetes and haven't actually employed policies, which when we asked, we saw very few hands go up. Um, but that's fine. Uh, there are loads of different ways and tools in order to get, get started a, in employing a policies and guardrails. The important thing is to get started. The sooner you get started, even if it's a bit of an effort at first, a, you're still going to reap the benefits massively in the end. Um, next thing, aim high, but start small. You don't have to do it all at once. Start with something simple that is actually attainable that different teams can collaborate on so then everybody sees the value in it. Once they see the value in a small thing, all of a sudden that in itself is a lot easier to scale because people understand why you're doing it. Um, and then make it something that is interactive among teams. Make your dev teams collaborate with your ops teams to understand the different, comp the different issues that each one is having. Make your SREs talk to your QA team because how often does that actually happen? But in doing so, you're actually bridging the knowledge gap that happens a lot of times, which actually is what makes your deployments more difficult to handle. It's the reason you have so many misconfigurations to start off with, because people don't always understand what needs to be done. Um, and then finally, desi <laughs> designate a policy leader. Um, it sounds silly, but the reality is there will be somebody on your team who, like myself, thinks that policy is super exciting and really helpful. So designate that person. Talk to your team, find out who they are, and designate them as the policy lead because in doing so, your policies will actually move forward. You'll get to, they will figure out, hey, look, this is a super easy way to implement pod security standards. Let's go ahead and try it. They can talk to different people and they can get that started. Oftentimes it's going to be a platform engineer, but not everybody has a platform engineer to be doing this. So talk to your team, see who's interested and, and get them started on it. And finally, crossing the policy bridge. So successful crossing of the policy bridge serves as a testament to the transformative power of actually focusing on helping your team collaborate and find mutual understanding because that's what policies actually do. They become the common language for people to be able to understand each other and their workflow pipelines. So using policies to emphasize shared responsibility, facilitate open communication, actually helps to transcend those siloed workflows that usually happen. Um, it builds empathy within a team. And so the integration of policies and guardrails doesn't just streamline your operations. It doesn't just get you up to compliance or optimize your developer experience. It actually strengthens the human bonds that are going on. It teaches people much more about the environment that they're actually working in so that they can be more successful. And above all, it makes for a much happier and productive DevOps team. So on that note, um, if you'd like to hear more about this or learn about open source tooling that can get you from code to cluster with policy and guardrail implementation, and you're here this week, please stop by our Monocle team booth, P35. I will be there. You'll get to see that Ole is not a figment of my imagination like Hobbs, um, because he will be there as well. Um, and if you're not here at KubeCon this week or you don't have time because there's so many other things going on, feel free to reach out individually at any point in time and we can have a chat. Thank you. Question for Courtney? Okay. So uh, you talked about, um, you know, you outlined the needs uh, for policies and then, you know, we talked about, you gave us some good insights on the implementation. Can you tell us about what that process looks like when you get your teams together and you're saying we have this need and how do you take that idea of the need in that discussion and turn it and, and architect that and roadmap into that before it ever goes into actual implementation so that that the collaborative process and identifying needs and then finding out like this, this need can be addressed doing this policy that way. Can you talk to us about that process a little bit? Yeah, there are loads of different ways to get started with it. Um, I think one of the most straightforward ways is, especially if you already have siloed teams, is directly ask each team, what are the issues that you're having? Uh, what misconfigurations are constantly popping up? What's taking up a ton of your time? Get those lists from people and then compare them. Because the truth is, 
all of DevOps is a cross-functional um, workflow. And so some of those things are going to actually cross teams, right? And so get those lists first and compare them, see what's connected, connect the dots there, and then you take the things that are common, uh, common issues for everyone, and then you get a team together and you say, okay, look, this is actually common for everybody. How does it affect you in development? How does it affect you in pre-deployment? How does it affect you as an SRE moving forward? And then establish your policies from there. There are loads of policies that are already out there created. It, Kaivorno maintains like 200 and some odd policies for their policy admission controller. Um, but there are also tools like Monocle that help you actually establish those rules beforehand. So. If you're not really sure where to start, ask your teams first, what are the misconfigurations that you're having constantly? What's taking up your time? What are the things that if you could troubleshoot them very quickly that you'd like to do? Compare those lists and then get started with creating very simple policies to take that forward first. Okay, any more questions? Okay then, thank Great. you so much. Thank you. We'll be back in five minutes.